Welcome. And my theme tonight is going to be initiation because we're initiating two people. And I want to make sense of it for all of us, those of you that have already been initiated into Kriya Yoga. Hopefully it will stimulate something in you and deepen your understanding of it. And if you haven't been initiated and you're considering it, it will certainly coax you in that direction. So let me start with, with just a story from my own life and not trying to make this about me, but you'll see how it connects with uh, with initiation. Essentially, from the time I was 14 to 16, I more or less raised myself, quite literally. Uh, I never made a proclamation that I was quitting school. I just stopped quitting school, going to school. Right? I didn't formally finish 8th, ninth, or 10th grade in a traditional sense. I ran the streets and um, was into some things I probably shouldn't have been into in hindsight. I wanted to do better. I wanted to be better. I was never unmotivated, but I didn't have the energy to do it, and I didn't have the know-how and the structure to do it. You could say I was uninitiated in, uh, in a meaningful life. And then when I went to live with a foster family when I was 16, I was initiated into their family. And the initiation had a couple of levels. One, they were a pretty healthy family, pretty healthy system. And my foster parents are still alive. <clears throat> They're in their mid-80s. In fact, they spent last weekend with us. And they initiated me, first of all, in some practical ways. Go to bed at the same time every night and go to bed relatively early. Get up at the same time every morning. And because they had a farm, like on a Saturday, we would have breakfast together as a family. And then there was chores. They helped me to structure, to learn how to structure my life and my time to be successful. They held me accountable when I didn't live up to my potential at that moment. So at one level, they taught me how to live in a way to maximize my success. So that was one level of the initiation. The next level of the initiation was they loved me, still love me to this day. And as time went on, I felt more and more of their love and got initiated into the family love. And that taught me how to be a family member. They had six biological children of their own, all younger than me. But they loved me into their family and taught me how to nurture a loving family for myself as I got older. Another level of initiation was kind of a virtue. My foster father is one of these people. He was, a, was high at Xerox here in Rochester. But if he, wasn't, if he didn't work at Xerox, he would have been a five-star general. If he ever joined the military, he would have been a five-star general. Just has that kind of presence. Even to this day when I'm with him, I sit a little straighter when I'm in his presence. And, but where I'm going with that, there was something I learned from watching him. He never gave up on anything worthwhile. In fact, when they were there this past weekend, there was a big boulder, it's a long story, there was a big boulder and where he was trying to create a basement to put an addition onto the house. And he had a back hole trying to get it up. He couldn't get it up, kept on trying. All the times it looked like the back hole was going to fall and he was going to crash. And he, at one point, came and sat down on the steps and just said, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And I'm just watching all this. Then he got back up. And he did it. And so I actually think of him sometimes when I want to quit something worthwhile. He wouldn't quit. So they initiated me into fortitude. But maybe at, at, at the most poignant level, and this, you'll see how all this translates into initiation into Kriya Yoga, there was a family, it wasn't just behavioral, it wasn't just cognitive, it wasn't just informational. The family had a certain energy and spirit and consciousness. 
So I got initiated into that family spirit and consciousness. And although I kept my identity as my biological family with my separate genetic roots and all of that, I also realized that I was at some point one of them. You see what I'm talking about? Their consciousness and their energy. All right. So what does all this have to do with initiation to Kriya Yoga? The seed of God is inside every one of us. The moment we were conceived, called it the divine spark, the divine image, but tonight I'll just talk about the seed of God was placed in the depths of our own souls. How do we know that? Don't we all long for happiness at the highest and deepest level? Don't we all long for a deeply meaningful life, not a superficial life, but a life of great depth? Don't we all have some intuition of paradise and love beyond what we can express? We all have that in us. And virtually everything we do is some attempt to realize that. I like to say this, you know, drug addicts are just misguided mystics looking for God in all the wrong places. Psychologists tell us that everything we do, and at some level this is good, it's not bad, everything we do is to avoid pain and to pursue something that we think is going to make us happy. That's the seed of God. It's almost like at one level, you know, God played a little dirty trick on us because we, we can't be content with anything else. I've known multimillionaires who wanted to be billionaires because we can never get enough of what we don't need. And what we ultimately need is that presence of the divine within us and around us. The problem, just like for me when I was 14 and 15, I couldn't initiate myself into a healthy life. I had to be initiated by a family, a system, that was living a healthy life. We can't be initiated into the divine on our own. No matter how hard we try, we really can't make that seed in us blossom in some sort of ultimate way. We can do a little bit, but we can't do a lot of bit. Why? Because we're not there. We're all like my 14 and 15 and 16 year old self doing our best, but we're all kind of lost. So in order to be initiated, we have to put ourselves in the presence of someone who can initiate us into the divine life and grow that divine seed. We have to have somebody who is a true sadguru. Now, if you've been to the Assisi Institute, you know my take on gurus. There's three levels of gurus. One level is somebody who just disseminates religious information. So if you own a religious bookstore, you're a guru. Very small g. And then the Sanskrit term is upa guru, little guru. So Richard Rohr, the Franciscan priest who has been a spiritual father to me, he's like an upa guru. And whenever I was in his presence, I always felt elevated. I still do when I'm in his presence. And his teachings inspire others. Then there's what we call a sad guru. That's a guru with an uppercase G. I'm talking about, just in a historical context, the Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, Ananda Moyama, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Babaji, our Kriya gurus. They are gurus, sad gurus of the highest order. That's why their pictures are on the altar. They have the capacity to fully and totally initiate us into this divine life. To the degree that we align ourselves with their consciousness. To the degree that we follow their teachings in a loving way. They have the capacity to grow that divine seed within us. And to bring it to its full expression. And they're not just a guru here and now. They are gurus for lifetimes. When Roy Eugene Davis, the one that initiated me into Kriya Yoga, direct disciple of Yogananda, when he met Yogananda, he said, Sir, I think we've been together in other lifetimes. 
And yes, Yogananda called him by the name Eugene. He said, no, my name's Roy. And Yogananda said, I know, but in your last life it was Eugene, and we were together. See, the Sadguru is, they're like a P.O. box for a divinity. And they take us under their wings once we give ourselves to them and we allow them to initiate us into the divine life, into the holy stream, as Sri Yukteswar would talk about it. Then they're with us in thick and thin. Should we fall to the greatest depths of hell? They're still with us, and they'll be with us to bring us out. That's a sad guru. And if we're going to go deeply in the spiritual life, if we're going to realize our full potential, we have to have a sad guru. Now, they don't need to be in the body. Yogananda was very clear about that. He said, Krishna and Jesus, for example, are very present to the human race. Our job is to develop a devotion to them so that we have that conscious contact, that sympathetic resonance. And they really help to guide us through every step of our life. They protect us from our own karma, even. So the reading tonight, it's the story of Jesus and the transfiguration, but I want to translate it into initiation. And I have some wonderful quotes from Sri Yukteswar in here. So Jesus, the sad guru, took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up to a high mountain. So let me say it this way. The guru is like a, the sad guru, as I'm talking about it, is like a, a force field of divine energy. You enter into their force field and they begin to elevate you, like a gravitational field. So Jesus takes James, Peter, and John. And there's just two little comments I want to make about that. We know that Jesus had 12 apostles and he had many disciples. Why did he take James, Peter, and John? Because they were the only ones willing to go all the way at that moment in time. It wasn't that he loved them more than he loved the others. They demonstrated in some way, shape, or form that they wanted to go all the way. Whenever we do that and express that to God and to the guru and we're sincere, we draw their blessing. The two people that are going to be initiated tonight, what they're saying to God and the universe is, I want to go all the way. That draws the guru to them. Like a magnet. Secondly, they didn't go up as individuals. They went as Jesus, Peter, James, and John. The point with that is we go together. All of the great religious founders of history, they always built a community because it really is a joint venture. I have, I'm blessed to be married to Vicki. She's part of my community. And there are times when I need her inspiration and there are times that she needs my inspiration. So we go together. We need each other. Yes, we have to go into our caves and we have to meditate. There are some things that we can only do ourselves. But in the overall context of our lives, we do it together. Secondly, Jesus took them up to a mountain. It's a great metaphor for initiation. He took them to a higher state of consciousness. That's what the mountain represents. Again, the guru is a force field of divine energy and love and truth and beauty. And when we align ourselves with them, they take us up, they elevate us. And, metaphorically, the mountain represents the seven chakras. Not only do they take us up in this sort of generic sense, Kriya Yoga specifically teaches us to unlock to cleanse, to unlock, and to open the, these channels, these chakras, and particularly to open our upper, higher chakras, where then we can experience the divine presence within us. Next, it said that his, he became white. White light just emanated from him. His clothes became dazzling white. There's a wonderful story with Yogananda. I've told it before, but it's worth telling again. Brother Bimalanda, who was from Rochester, New York, he told us this story 
um, himself. He's a direct, was a direct disciple of Yogananda. He said um, Yogananda gave a teaching where he told them not to gossip about each other. Don't say negative things about fellow disciples. So two weeks later, Ben Milanda's with Yogananda, and Yogananda says, how's brother so-and-so doing? And Ben Milanda said he wasn't doing well, and he started to say that he wasn't doing well, but then he realized, this is a test. And he said, Master, you know. I don't need to tell you. And then he said, Yogananda radiated white light to him. He blessed him. So the guru takes us up to the mountain. They teach us how to go up to the mountain. And then there's a gradual light that begins to develop and unfold within our consciousness. And that light enlightens us. That light purifies us. That light warms our heart. And it illumines our eyes so that we begin to discern truth from untruth. We begin to discern and to see the presence of God in other people and in all creation. They illumine us. Well, then what happens is they get kind of oh, Elijah and Abraham and Moses are there. Well, in this account, it's just Moses and Elijah. And they're talking to Jesus. And Peter, James, and John are like, whoa, you know, are we on an acid trip? No, Jesus is really talking. There's a line in Sri Yukteswar's book, The Holy Science, where he said if we practice and we practice, we get taken up in the Mahaloka. In Sanskrit, that means the great heaven. I'm telling you, if you stay on this path, you will begin to experience yourself as having a foot in the heavenly realms. And there are higher and higher heavenly realms. And you will experience their presence in your life. These unseen hands guiding you. It becomes more and more real and palpable. I'm going to tell you a story. This is a true story. This was maybe 10 years ago. And often around... Three o'clock in the morning, I get woken up. And the ohm is buzzing, and I can't sleep. And I usually get up and I meditate. Last night I had that happen, a little bit earlier, like around 1.30. This time, I can't tell you how I knew. I knew that ohm buzzing was the presence of an angel. So I shook Vicky, and she said, I know, I know, the ohm is buzzing, and you're going to get up and meditate. I said, no, it's an angel. And you can ask her this. I'm not making this up. As soon as I finished that sentence on my phone, my iPhone, and I didn't have a program, the song by George Harrison came on, My Sweet Lord. And we just looked at each other like, whoa. Okay? I'm not special. I'm not a guru. I'm just one of Yogananda's waters boys. That's all I am. My point is, the more that we meditate and practice this, we have access to the Mahaloka. Loka, again, just means heavenly realms. And there are many heavenly realms. And we never walk alone. Then, Peter, and they're kind of caught in his ecstasy, and they said, oh, let's just stay here. Let's build booth. Let's just stay here. And then there's this voice from the heavens, God saying, this is my beloved son, whom with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I could give a whole retreat just on that line, but let me just give a simple breakdown for initiation. They experience God communion. They experience a moment of union with God. And out of that union came wisdom, came instruction. Listen to him. Listen to the guru. Again, I'll just speak from my own experience. I used to read things at the beginning that Yogananda would say, and I'd say, oh, come on, this is hyper hyperbole. How can this be? I don't understand it. And every time I have followed what Yogananda has said, it always elevates me. It always improves the quality of my life and my consciousness. 
in the teachings of yoga or Kriya, of Yogananda and the Kriya masters, but you can say the same thing for the Gospels and the Bhagavad Gita. You, we have unfailable metaphysical truths that empower us how to live lives. I, I taught the technique tonight, the Kriya technique to Daniel and to Christian, and I said, end every meditation even if it's just a minute, read the words of Yogananda, read the words of the Bhagavad Gita, read the words of Jesus. They become a force in your life that guides you. Sri Yukteswar talks about, I'm gonna read what he wrote. Well, I don't know if I even have the notes here. Yes. Sri Yukteswar says, What is needed is a guru, a savior, who will awaken us to devotion, to love, and to perceptions of truth. Through the guru, through the savior, the son of man, that is us, is baptized or initiated or absorbed into the stream of spiritual light and rises above the darkness. That's what the guru does. The last thing in this story that I think is very important, again, they want to stay up there and just stay in ecstasy, which is impossible. And Jesus said, we have to go down the mountain. None of us are going to spend 24 hours a day meditating. I don't recommend it. None of us are ready for it. It would blow your circuits. Don't even try. When we're not meditating, serve the world. When we're not meditating, love other people. When we're not meditating, serve other people. Because that's meditating. Because everybody in the world, guess what? They're God in drag. Right? So when you serve them and you love them, you're serving God. You're meditating. It elevates you. I had lunch today. My, both my sons are in town, my youngest son, Michael. And we had lunch today. Um, and the first time he's ever said this to me, he said, um, someday I'm going to do Kriya Yoga. I said, that's good. He said, you know, I meditate every day. And I said, I know. He said, I have the autobiography next to my bed. I said, yep, that's great. He said, you know, I think Babaji is my guru. I said, well, you can't go wrong with Babaji. But that was so sweet. He said, you know, I do listen to some of the things you say. And I said, well, I hope so. And not what I do, but what I say, listen, okay? And he said, so whatever I do, he said, even if it's at the gym, I now do it for God. That's it. Meditate, serve the world, and whatever you do, do it for God. And I'll close with this little story. Therese the Little Flower, she's a saint in the Catholic Church. She died right around the time Yogananda was born, in the late 1800s. And she tells this story. She's like this little girl with short legs trying to climb these very steep stairs. And she can't get her legs up, no matter how hard she tries. Such a sweet story. And she says, God standing at the top of the stairs, and he's looking down, he's seeing her efforts, and her failures, but seeing her effort. And she says, in one foul swoop, he bends down and picks her up and takes her to himself. That's it. We keep on practicing, we keep on showing up. And there are times we think we're not making progress, but we are. And the day will come when God will just scoop you up and take you to the divine heart. It all begins with initiation. Initiation is almost like wedding vows. You can still be married to your wife and everything, don't, don't worry. But this is the point. A vow is much bigger than a promise. When you make a vow, as Yogananda said, you're putting an imprint in the ether and you're creating a powerful vibration. 
And whenever we make a vow, all of heaven takes notice and comes to our aid. That's what they're doing tonight. They're making a vow that, that, that the goal of their life is to be self-realized and God-realized. And heaven is taking notice tonight. Jesus said it a little bit differently. He said, whenever anybody repents, repents doesn't mean you're a bad person. You turn around from ignorance and you walk and you move towards the truth and light and goodness and love. He said, the angels in heaven throw a party. He didn't say a party. He said they rejoice, but they throw a party. Okay. So I'm going to have them come up in a moment for the initiation. I want to sign off to the people online because we don't show the initiation um, virtually. So thank you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you in some way, shape, or form next week.